You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Bible Answer. My name is Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher of the Central <coughs> Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri, and I serve as the moderator of this program. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and is supported by 52 congregations of the Churches of Christ in a six-state area. We're glad you're watching today. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Kevin Thomason, and I preach for the Main Street Church of Christ in Troy, Tennessee. My name is Ronnie Gutam. I'm from Kakinada, India. I do mission work over there. My name is Justin Beard, and I'm the preacher for the Bishop Street Church of Christ in Union City, Tennessee. We're glad to have each of these brethren with us. Today is Brother <coughs> Beard's first time to be on a Bible Answer. We're especially glad to have him on with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Thomason. The person says, I wonder if you could address 1 John 5, 7 and 8 on a Bible answer. These verses read differently in the New King James, English Standard Version, and American Standard Version, making it a little hard to understand. We'll give that to you, Brother Thomason. Thank you so much for the question. It's good to understand before we look at those verses some things that are going on in 1 John. One of the purposes of the book, of course, is to stress the necessity of believing that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Son of God. Eternal life depends upon that, 1 John 5 and verse 11. Something else that is going on in the book, John is refuting some of the false doctrine that had entered into the church by false teachers in that day and time. There were those in that day and time that were denying the deity of Jesus. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? So they're denying the deity of our Lord and Savior. There were others that were denying that uh, Jesus had come in the flesh. They were denying the humanity of Jesus. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 3, and every spirit that confess, confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So there were those denying His deity. There were those denying His humanity. So it's important that we understand that as we are looking at chapter 5. In chapter 5, John is offering up further evidence that certainly supports that yes, Jesus is divine. Yes, God did come down and dwell in the flesh. John chapter 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. You come down to verse 14 in John 1, we see the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the second person of the Godhead. He came down, He dwelt in a human body. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and following, very good commentary on that. We are speaking, of course, of our Lord and Savior here. It is necessary that we believe that He is the Son of God, that we, we need to know that. It's necessary that we believe that He came and dwelt in the flesh. So keep that in mind as we start looking at 1 John 5. Now I'm going to begin reading in verse 4 in that context. For, what's, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That faith must be supported. He's going to give us support here. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's absolutely necessary in order for us to overcome the world, which is another way of saying saved, salvation, verse 11. This is he, referring to Jesus, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. John mentions three things here. Water, blood, the Spirit. He is offering these things as evidence. Note verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, 
the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. That is, their testimony agrees. It's all the same thing. It's all one. And so John is offering up evidence to support one's belief in the deity of Jesus, one's belief in His humanity, God in the flesh. He offers up as evidence water, blood, and the Spirit. These will be witnesses to verify that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact the Son of God. So we look again at verse 6. This is He that came. He came. He came. This would be the first advent. So that is established here. He came by water. What exactly does that mean? Friends, that's referring to, and I don't know what else it would be referring to, but the baptism of our Lord and Savior. Well, how would that stand as a witness that He is in fact the Son of God? Well, let's simply look at the account. Matthew 3, 16, And Jesus, when He was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Lo, the heavens were opened unto Him, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon Him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. So here we see Jesus being baptized, the Spirit descending upon Him and remaining upon Him, and the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. So when you consider the events surrounding the baptism of Christ, it's solid proof that He is in fact the Son of God. And then think about John's record, John the Baptist, over here in uh, John chapter 1. Let's just look at verse 32 and follow him. John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So shortly before our Lord and Savior entered into His earthly ministry, He is baptized. Think about the events surrounding that baptism. It's solid proof. It stands as a witness that He is in fact the Son of God. And then we think about He came by blood. That's something else that John mentions over here in 1 John chapter 5. He came by water, not by water only, but He came by water and blood. The only thing that I know that that would refer to would be the death of our Lord and Savior. The crucifixion where He shed His blood, that occurred at the end of His earthly ministry. Well, likewise, think about the events surrounding that death. When we think about that, let's turn our attention to Matthew chapter 27. Note, if you would, verse 50 and following. Jesus, when He had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. The earth did quake, the rocks rent, the graves were opened, many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave after His resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they which were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So when you think about His death upon the cross, and then you think about the events surrounding that crucifixion, and we've only noticed a portion there in Matthew 27, and then the events connected to that death a few days later. Think about His resurrection three days later. All of these events surrounding that stands as a witness that He is in fact the Son of God. And then John mentions the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Well, He's the one that's delivered this message. So this is what John is doing. He is establishing witnesses to verify that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact the Son of God. What are our witnesses here? Water, blood, and the Spirit. Now look at the conclusion in verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, and we generally do, in a courtroom situation where facts are being determined and they're trying to verify things, well, if you have a witness to what has occurred, that's good. If you've got two witnesses, that's better. If you've got three witnesses, that's even better. 
that would establish and verify facts. And we generally accept that. Well, if we do that with men, what about the witness of God? John says the witness of God is greater. And that's what this is about. God has given us three witnesses concerning the deity and the humanity of our Lord and Savior. And that's the gist of what's going on in this context. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you, Brother Thompson, for that good answer. Now to Brother Gudum. The person says, I want so much for my husband to obey the Lord. What can I do to help him become a Christian? Brother Gudum. Thank you for that question. It is an important question. There are many in our Christian uh, families that struggle because they're either their spouse is not a Christian or the children are not a Christian and they are struggling to bring them to Christ. It is a good thing that there is someone in the family that loves them and cares enough for them to try to make them a Christian. There are many things that I, I feel that you can do to help your spouse or your family member to become a Christian. First of all, let me ask you to pray fervently for them because the Lord gives as you pray. And also James talks about saying the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much in James 5.16. Pray that the Lord will be patient with your spouse. Subsequently, you need to pray for opportunities to be present to them to see the truth. And when they do, and if you are, if you are in a position to influence them, pray that for yourself that you have the right things to say to, the, to them so that they can see the truth. Pray that they will not resist obeying the gospel. Pray that, that your husband or your, or your spouse, that, uh, that they will finally see it. And when they see it, they'll be able to walk in the light. Subsequently, ask the prayers for the church. At the same time, let your husband or your spouse know that you're praying for them so that they know that there's someone that is truly uh, loving them and care enough for them. Secondly, be patient with them. Now, for some, gospel understanding of the gospel comes easy. For some, it'll be very difficult. So we need to be patient with them. And James 1, 4 says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect in entire, wanting nothing. And also, thirdly, I will tell you this. Please talk to your husband about your faith. In this world, there are a lot of people, or even Satan is influencing them, not to talk about Christ. But if you are not going to talk about Christ and God and the Bible and the church, who else is going to do that? You need to talk about fervently. You need to talk fervently about your faith to your husband. Subsequently, if you have, if you have children, teach them about God and God's word. Let your husband see that having godly wife and godly children is a good thing. At the same time, I will ask you to arrange personal Bible studies with your husband. If it's possible, let you let, uh, take it to the eldership where you worship, or take it to your preachers, or maybe you meet with the other brethren in the congregation that can come and study the Bible with your husband and yourself. And if it is possible, arrange some devotional time at your home so that they can see what it is like a, to be a Christian. And if you, it is possible, please go and visit other families in the area that do have these family devotions so that he will know more about the Word of God. But subsequently, whenever these studies are conducted, make sure the plan of salvation is presented towards them. Without them, they would not know how does one become a Christian and what is the need for obe obeying the Lord. Subsequently, there are a few uh, recommendations I would give, tell you right now. One of the courses that is popular in the brotherhood is Back to the Bible. And another course is Basic Bible Course by Brother Ira Rice. These two courses, when we combine these and study with the lost souls, they have seen very good results in the past. And maybe it is, would be for your husband as well. I would also encourage you to look at the scriptures in Acts 246, 2.46 and Acts 2.47 because where the church gathered in every home and the Lord was adding to them daily to the church. Now, these are my recommendations. There may be others that you might think in your personal judgment that might help your husband to see the Word of God and become a Christian. 
Thank you, Alan, again for your question. Thank you, Brother Goodham. We reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled Evolution versus Christianity, A War of Worldviews. If you'd like to have this tract or our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, or to send us your question, just contact us. You can write us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by means of our website at www.abibleanswertv.org. Past programs are archived there for your viewing. There's also a connection to our YouTube channel where you can watch programs there. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also search the scripts. You can email us at abibleanswered.earthlink.net or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463. Back to our questions today. Now to Brother Beard for his first question, a Bible answer. The person asked, why did Jesus curse the fig tree in Matthew 21, 19? Brother Beard. You know, I think this is a great question. Uh, there's a lot of people who look at this instance in the life of Jesus, and what they see is Jesus being petty, Jesus being a little vindictive toward a poor tree. But, you know, I don't think that's, ex that's at all why Matthew told us about this. To help us understand what's happening here, I think it's important for us to see also what other passages of Scripture say. Uh, Mark records this same instance, but he does it a little bit differently. Matthew focuses more on subject matter, and so he groups uh, subjects together. But Mark is more interested in chronology. And so he puts the events of this, uh, uh, the events of this story in chronological order. And I think when we compare these two accounts, we're going to find... A, um, uh, uh, an important clue as to what's going on here. Basically what's happening is this. Jesus is coming up to a fig tree that has leaves. It should have figs. But there are no figs. And so he curses the fig tree. He tells it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth for, uh, henceforward forever. In Matthew 21, 19. And uh, then he continues on his way. Comes into Jerusalem, goes into the temple. He expects to find in the temple good worship going on, but that's not at all what's going on. He finds there these uh, money changers that are, sh uh, that are um, uh, effectively stealing from people, and he drives out those money changers. You might be familiar with that story. Then he comes out of the temple, and he comes back to the fig tree, and he finds that the, wig tr that the fig tree has withered away, and the disciples marvel at this. And they say, wow, look at how this fig tree is, has withered away so quickly. And the Lord tells them in Matthew 21, 21, beginning, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye say to the mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. I think what's happening here is two things. First of all, Jesus is giving to the disciples an object lesson. He outright explains why he did this to the fig tree and what they can learn from it. Jesus is going to expect of the disciples not long from now that they should go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. And they need to be able to do so. They need to be able to confirm that what they're saying is the word of God. And so he tells them in Mark 16 that they would go on and they would perform many signs and wonders and that they would be able to do many things. And Jesus explains here that they only would be able to do so if they had faith in God. Let me put it this way. Just as Jesus came to the fig tree expecting to find figs, he would expect to come and find the disciples having faith. And what would he find when he came to inspect their work? Jesus is effectively telling his disciples he had better find some faith. He had better find them effectively preaching the word of God. But there's another object lesson in here that we can find from Mark's account over in Mark chapter 11. It's interesting that Mark interrupts, interrupts the fig tree account with the story of his going and, and driving out the money changers. Matthew groups this more according to subject, as I said a minute ago. Mark's interested in chronology. What's the connection there? Why, why do we have that story in the middle of the fig tree? Well, I think the answer is basically the same, that in the fig tree you can find a symbol, uh, kind of a, 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 a comparison or a parallel to what Jesus found or did not find in the temple. 
as he wanted to come to the disciples and find faith, he expected to go to the temple and find worship, find faith there, and he did not find it. And so just as he cursed the fig tree to wither away, he drove out these money changers. And later on in Matthew chapter 23 and 24, he would explain how he was uh, effectively pronouncing the withering away or the destruction of the temple. And so just as he cursed this fig tree to wither away, this would be a symbol for the faithless worship that was going on in the temple. But it would also be a good object lesson for the disciples that as they went out, they didn't need to be like the fig tree and not have figs, not have faith. They needed to be able to go out and to preach the gospel and to confirm what the Lord was saying through them by the signs and miracles, by the faith that they had in God. Great question and a great study. Thank you for your, uh, for your question. Thank you. To Brother Thomason, why should Christians be concerned about modesty? Brother Thomason. Thank you so much for the question. Simply put, Christians should be concerned about modesty because they are Christians. Friends, when we think about being a Christian, the simple definition of that is one who follows Christ. Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Our Lord and Savior left us an example to follow. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. And we can be sure that the example that Jesus left us to follow, He is modest and decent to the greatest degree. You think about the simple definition of modesty, as I've just mentioned, decent. To be modest is to be decent. Christians should always strive to be modest in their dress, in their demeanor, and in their mind. We know that our Lord and Savior always was modest. He was always decent. Think about the instructions that we find in the Gospel of Christ. There is concern expressed over modesty. We are commanded to be modest. Think about 1 Timothy 2, 9, for example. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. God expects His Christian women to be modest in apparel. Now, if the woman is to be modest in her apparel, so is the man. God does not have double standards. He wants all of His people to be modest in dress, in their demeanor, and in their thinking. Think about the instructions given concerning the qualifications of a bishop. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior. This phrase here of good behavior, orderly, it carries the same idea as the word modest. In fact, it's the same in the Greek that you see in 1 Timothy 2, 9. Women are to dress in modest apparel. A bishop is to be modest, decent, not only in his apparel, but in his demeanor and in his thinking. So the Bible gives us instructions to be modest. We should be concerned about it. Let's think about what Jesus said in John 8, verse 12. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus also said in Matthew 5, 14, He said, Ye are the light of the world. His people should reflect His example. Well, if we are immodest in our life, how could we be reflecting the example of our Lord and Savior? How could we glorify God if we are li living in immodesty or indecency? We might also consider what the Scripture tells us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Well, friends, think about that just for a moment. How could we glorify God in our body and in our spirits if we are immodest, if we are indecent. It is something that we should give serious consideration to. Let's think about what Paul said in Philippians 1 and verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, 
Can you imagine someone saying that if they are living a life that's indecent, a life that's immodest? Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, we mentioned earlier, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. If I'm living a life that's immodest and indecent, could I say that? So we should be concerned about modesty because our Lord and Savior was very concerned about it. He wants His people to be modest. He wants His people to be decent. And let's strive to do that in our lives. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you so much to Brother Thomason, to Brother Goodham, to Brother Beard for serving as panelists today on a Bible Answer. We appreciate their efforts very much. <coughs> this is the uh, first time this show will air will be on the first day of the new year. 20 and verse 23, Happy New Year to each of you. Very often we make resolutions at this time of year and then we let them go by the wayside by about February. But uh, I did uh, find this uh, on a devotional for today regarding resolutions, which I thought was good. I am resolved to forget past mistakes and press on to greater achievements. I am resolved to put first things first. I am resolved to make my work a joy, to allow nothing to disturb my peace of mind, to never lose self-control, to spend so much time improving myself that I have no time for criticism of others, to think the best, work for it, and expect it, to be a friend to man, to stand for the right, to be true, to be kind, to take every disappointment as a stimulant. I like that one. To live on the sunny side of every cloud, to smile, to look ahead, to keep moving. The statesman Benjamin Franklin said, Resolve to perform what you ought, perform without fail what you resolve. Of course, Luke 16, 4, I am resolved what to do. Let's make good resolutions this year, and let's seek to keep what we resolve to do. I hope that you're in Christ today, and that you're a faithful Christian. If you're not, contact us. We'd love to talk with you. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.